Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video, we're going to talk about examples involving Le Chatelier's principle. Now, if you were asked about Le Chatelier's principle on a test, you could either be asked about it in the context of an FRQ question, where you actually have to justify how you would reestablish equilibrium, um, or you could be asked about it in a multiple choice question where they just give you some options where they ask you, hey, would I shift towards reactants or products? Would reactants or products increase or decrease? So depending on the style of the problem will depend on how detailed you really need to get in your processing. So let's look at our example here. It says using the equilibrium synthesis reaction of nitrogen dioxide gas from nitrogen gas and oxygen gas, and they give us a delta H of the reaction of a positive 68 kilojoules, we wanna predict the effects of the following types of stress. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write myself a balanced equation. So I know I have N2 gas and O2 gas, there's my nitrogen gas and my oxygen gas, and I'm going to put a two-way reversible arrow here, and that is making NO2, nitrogen dioxide gas. Now I do need to balance this. Um, I see I have two nitrogens over here, so on my product side I need to put two NO2, and as a result of putting that two here, that doubles my amount of oxygen, so therefore I need to come over here on my reactant side and put a two. The other thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to place my heat as a reactant or product. I notice my delta H of the reaction is a positive 68 kilojoules. And hopefully we remember when I see a positive value for that heat change that that would be endothermic. And so in this being endothermic, what that would mean is that my heat would be a reactant. Now I'm just going to write the word heat here to remind me that that's where my heat goes. You could actually write the 68 kilojoules there if you wanted to. Um, it really doesn't make a difference since this is not a thermochemical equation. So you can kind of pick what you want to do there. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our first example. It says that we are going to add nitrogen gas to this. And I notice the nitrogen gas is on the reactant side here. So let's think about what that would do. If I add in a reactant, that is going to make the denominator of my ratio too big. And so in making that bigger, what would happen is my overall ratio would end up decreasing. So as a result, my Q is going to get smaller. Now, if my Q gets smaller, what that would mean is that my Q is going to be less than my K value. However, remember, I don't want that. I want the Q to equal K. So I need to fight to get my ratio back. So if I want to increase this ratio again, if those reactants were too big, then I want those to decrease. And in those decreasing, as a result, my products would increase. That those two effects together would enable us to get my Q back to equaling my K value. So if I'm decreasing reactants and increasing products, that is a shift to the product side. And as we said, shifting to the products means that I'm decreasing my reactant concentration and increasing my product concentration to reestablish my equilibrium. Now again, you could think of this like a seesaw. If I had a seesaw where I added to the reactant side, so now that side is too heavy. I need to shift some of those things to the other side, to the product side, in order to get my balance of equilibrium back. That's essentially what I'm trying to do here. Now, if I was talking through an FRQ question, these would be the exact points I would mention in my justification. If they said, hey, I add N2, what does that do to my equilibrium and how would we shift in order to reestablish equilibrium? I would say, well, hey, adding N2 is adding a reactant. That would cause my Q to decrease, which causes the Q to be smaller than K. So therefore, I need to increase Q to reestablish equilibrium. So to do that, I would shift to the product side. In shifting to the products, the reactants would go down and the products would go up.
So those are the exact talking points I would want to work my way through if I was justifying a free response question. However, I'll be honest with y'all, if I was doing, say, a multiple choice question, I might get a little more sneaky with this. If you remember, we talked about that we shift away from what we add and towards what we remove to replace it. And so if I was answering an FRQ question where they just asked me, hey, which direction are we shifting in? I would say, well, if I'm adding a reactant, I am shifting away from what I add. And so that would mean I'm shifting to the product side. Or if they ask me, you know, what would happen to the concentration of reactants and products, I know if I shift away from what I add, then that means that products is going to increase and as a result, reactants would decrease. So I can get a little sneakier with it if all I'm trying to do is answer an FRQ question. You don't necessarily need to think through that whole Q versus K thing. On a free response question, though, you definitely want to talk through the Q versus K thing. All right, let's do our next one here. It says that we're going to remove O2. Well, again, O2 is a reactant. So now if I remove a reactant, that's going to make my denominator too small. And so my ratio is going to end up overall too big. That's going to cause my ratio, my Q, to increase. That throws us off of our equilibrium constant. So now my Q ends up larger than my K. So in order to get equilibrium back, I would here want to shift to the reactants. Again, if I made that reactant too small, I need to take some of those products and shift them to the reactants to get it a little bigger again. Okay, now in shifting to the reactants, what would happen is that my reactant concentrations would increase and my product concentrations would decrease. Now, if you're in doubt about whether or not you did this right, you could use the little trick I taught you. We shift away from what we add, but we shift towards what we remove to replace it. So if I removed this O2 out of the container, I would want to shift towards it to replace it which means I'm shifting to the reactant side, and so therefore reactants go up, products go down. All right, now the next one talks about changing the volume of the reaction vessel. Now, first off, I would want to double check and make sure I had gases happening here, which we do, because if I didn't have any gases, then this would be no effect, okay? But we are going to have effects here because we have gases. And I also notice that I have a different number of moles of gas on either side. On this reactant side, this is an understood one here. So I have three total moles of reactants and only two total moles of products that are gases. So decreasing the volume of my reaction vessel, that would mean I'm making my container smaller. And remember, if I'm making my container smaller and that pressure shoots up in there, everything's starting to feel really squished and really stressed out. So it would help to shift to a side where I have less moles of gas. Remember, if I'm having a party and I decrease the size of the room I'm having the party in, I want less people at my party. Gases work the same way. So what that would mean here is that I'm gonna shift to the product side. And if you wanna give yourself a reason here, again, that is because I have less moles. On that product side. And so in shifting to the product side, that means that my reactants would decrease and my products would increase. Now, you notice I didn't worry about the Q versus K here, but I'll be honest, here's what's happening. When I decrease that volume of the reaction vessel, each one of these concentrations would increase. But remember, I had more moles over here, so the increase of reactants is more noticeable than the increase of products. And so that would mean that my reactants got too big, and so that's why we're shifting to the product side. So you could do a Q versus K thing, but honestly, talking about the number of moles is by far the easiest way of justifying what that would do to our equilibrium. All right, now the next one talks about heating the reaction vessel. So on this one, I need to think about where that heat is located at. I see that heat right now is a reactant. And so in heating the reaction vessel, I am adding to that heat value over here. Now, I'm gonna think about this one from a little bit different perspective. And the reason why is because 
I'm no longer just changing Q and then have to shift back to K. I'm going to be changing this to a whole brand new K. So I'm actually going to start off over here with these columns this time. I know if I heat the reaction vessel in using my little trick, I know that I shift away from what I add. So that means if I'm adding to heat, I would shift away from that side. And so therefore, I am shifting to the products. which would mean that my reactants would decrease and my product concentrations would increase. But then think about what that does to my K value. If I'm increasing those products, making that numerator larger, and I'm decreasing those reactants, making that denominator smaller, that would cause my K value to increase. And here I am changing to a new K. It's not just that I'm trying to get back to K. I'm changing to a brand new K. So here my K would increase. You would not on these heat ones need to talk about a comparison of Q versus K because again, I'm never getting to a Q that's different than K. I'm just changing K to some new value. All right, now I'll be honest with y'all. These last two are kind of tricks. Let's talk about why. The first one here, it says that I'm gonna add xenon. Now, I know that xenon is in group 18. I know group 18 are the noble gases. I know that the noble gases are inert, meaning they don't react with anything. And so if I put xenon into this, it's not gonna react with any of these gases. So it's not going to affect any of these molarities, any of these concentrations. So therefore, this guy right here would cause no equilibrium shift. It would do pretty much nothing, which is kind of nice, right? Now, the one thing it would do is it would increase the total pressure in the container, but it wouldn't change any of the individual pressures or individual molarities of any of these gases. Now, one more down here, adding a catalyst. Hopefully we recognize that one too. Remember, a catalyst will speed up our reaction, but it doesn't change amounts of any of these things. So on adding a catalyst, what we're gonna do is we're also going to put no equilibrium shift. Again, the reason why is because it doesn't change any of the amounts that we have. The only thing that it would do is it would help us to reach equilibrium faster. So let's say I did apply, you know, one of the other kinds of stress, like I removed oxygen or added nitrogen or something like that. If I also had a catalyst involved, my seesaw would balance out a lot more quickly, but it doesn't change the balance of the seesaw in any way. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just a moment and pause the video and see if you can try out the rest of the ones on this table. So go ahead, pause it, try it out. All right, y'all, did you pause it? Did you try them out? I'm gonna hope that you did. I'm gonna go ahead and throw my answers up here so you can see how you did. And you can check and see if you got the right answers. All right, I hope you're feeling good about Le Chatelier's principle and this whole idea that if we do something to throw ourselves off of equilibrium, we got to fight to get that equilibrium back. Um, hopefully we're not feeling too much stress about this where we need to perform a Le Chatelier's principle on ourselves, right? That'd be bad. Okay. Anyways, um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.